an event took place October 31st. It wasn't Halloween. It was uh, Martin Luther tacked the 95 Thesis on the, on the door of the Wittenberg Church. And 1517, 500 years ago, you know, 500 years, is, is, that, that's, a, that's a long time. <laughs> it's kind of hard to get your mind around 500 years. That's over double the length of American history. It's longer than the children of Israel were in the land of Egypt. It's longer than the distance between Malachi and Matthew in your old, in, between the Old Testament and New Testament. It's a long time. And it's a cycle of history. Uh, you know, it, and it's, it's hard, if it's hard to fathom that kind of time length, it's harder, frankly, to, to fathom what our lives would be like today if the Reformation hadn't taken place. You live through life and sometimes you don't realize the things that, that, that set the course and the flow of your life. Now, I don't trace my spiritual heritage to the Reformation. Okay, And frankly, I don't make a lot of the Reformation in my spiritual heritage because people like us were there long before the Reformation. But... I do recognize and thank God for the spiritual and historic significance of the Reformation. Here's a book called The Reformation 500. Uh, this is a book that was put out in celebration of, of the event. And it's a book of, if you, wanna, if you want to understand something about the social, when I say social, I'm talking about music, art, literature, technology, all of those things that you enjoy have been directly impacted, would not be the way they are, except for the Reformation. There'd be something different. The, the economy we live in, the educational system, the, the modern science, religious impact of the Reformation is, uh, it literally changed the, the trajectory of Western civilization. In fact, what we call Western civilization is really the fruit of the Protestant Reformation in its social, economic, political, educational, scientific, so forth, influence. This book goes through those things. Fascinating read to give you some historical perspective. If you don't want to read a book like that, and I'm not selling them, we don't have them in the bookstore, but you can Google it. I bought that one off of Amazon some time ago. You can buy everything off of Amazon. Use Amazon Smile. Shorewood Bible Church, Amazon Smile, we get a tenth of a hundredth of a percentage of anything you buy. <laughs> but it amounts to 15 bucks a year, so, you know, buy more stuff. But uh, <laughs> I saw a thing the other day, you got to go and buy a $32,000 automobile. I thought, now there, I buy that on Smile. <laughs> now, now you're going. But uh, if, if some of you were up at Brother Brian Ross's conference a couple of weeks ago, in Grand Rapids, and it was about the Reformation, about the, the histor historical events and so forth. If you wanted information about that, I think there's a 107-page syllabus from that thing that you can read about. It's like going to you know, a college class and, uh, and so forth. But it's worth knowing about those things, okay? And the, 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 in particular, God used the Reformation to break the political power of the Roman church. The Roman Catholic Church. He used it to disseminate and, and bring about the widespread availability of the Word of God. That's the most important thing that it did. And thus the preaching of the gospel in a wide open kind of way. It led Europe out of the Dark Ages. And by the way, the American brand of Western civilization is the specific fruit of the Protestant Reformation. Our economic freedoms, our political liberties, the fact that you have a First Amendment that separates church and state, now that didn't, that Europe didn't do that. Europe was bound, uh, and the reformers didn't do it, but the American application of it produced those things. If you ever wonder where freedom of speech comes from, where does Freedom of religion come from, the separation of powers and so forth. They come as the direct fruit of the Protestant Reformation applied in a new world on a new canvas without the history that it, of the baggage that it came out of. 
And when you do, and by the way, it was it was more or less contemporaneous to these events taking place. The turmoil, the the, the, fer, the fervor, and fermenting of ideas. So it is important to understand it as a as a historical event. Now I have to say to you, I said I I'm not a big proponent proponent of the reformers and the reform because we were there before, and I'm also aware. And I say this for those of you who've questioned about this. I'm aware. We're aware of the, of the doctrinal, ecclesiastical, eschatological shortcomings of the Reformers. They didn't believe in a rapture. They didn't think about the, the uh, you know, they, they had some real bad doctrine. I know that they were deeply flawed individuals, that some of them persecuted our spiritual and our real spiritual ancestors. But the truth is that we're all flawed, folks. And the fact that God uses any of us is a testimony to His grace. And because the Reformation literally changed the trajectory of, of, of Western history, because this month, <coughs> the 31st, marked the 500th anniversary, Alex and I decided to talk with you about that in, in all that ways. And the, what we wanted to emphasize wasn't the men and the events and the arguments, but those three solos that come out of the Reformation, that it was built on. And by the way, nobody during that time said we're going to have these three solas. That's histori hist historians looking back and identifying them. But those three, now, nowadays people identify five and even seven. But that's because as soon as the Calvinists get involved in it, it gets to be, you know, two turns into 30. It's just the way they think. But when you look back at it, the sola, scripture alone, grace alone, and faith alone. Those three things were what brought the light and information. And of those three things, the most important one is the scripture. We looked at it last time in Romans 5. He says it's a faith that it might be of grace. Grace requires but will, only, will accept only the response of faith. So faith is what establishes grace, and grace requires faith. But both require the Scripture, not tradition, but the Scripture as the source of things. And so that's really the thing that, that, that is, is where the spiritual power of the Reformation, the spiritual power of anything, comes from. So the, I have a final question. I, I, I we were going to be finished last week, and then Alex taught, that, Alex taught that thing in James 2 about Luther's epistle of straw, and I thought, well, we need to add that to the, we're going to put this in a package, of, in, a, in an album. And I thought, well, we need to add that. But if I do that, the people in the office, they say, you got five, you need six. You had four, why'd you add five? So I thought, well, there is, a, there is one other question. And that is the question that we really face today. Is the Reformation over? And the answer to that, my answer to that is, yeah, probably. You're looking at our culture today, and what you are seeing is the demise, not simply of a way of life, and, and you're seeing the demise of what supported that way of life. And what supported it, it was the, the, the influence that came out of the spiritual, the social, economic, political, uh, religious application of the forces that produced, the spiritual power that produced the Reformation. The underlying things that pinned it are, 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 are gone. So what, what does that mean for us as believers? And I would answer it this way. We're going to have to go back to the days of yore. Now, most of you aren't old enough to remember the TV days of yore. <laughs> Y'all never watched The Long Ranger when you were young, see? You watched it when Johnny Depp did it, and he didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> but the, we're going to go back to the way it was before. There were people just like us there, and we're going to wind up going back doing the things that they did, doing ministry the way they did it. If you look at Acts chapter number 19, and I want you to contrast Acts 19 verse 10, where Paul is at Ephesus in Acts chapter 19, and the greatest revival, if you want to call it that, the greatest 
outreach ministry that Paul had, the place where his ministry took root and spread all across a whole territory that's recorded in Scripture is in Acts 19 at Ephesus. Paul spends two years there in Acts chapter 19, verse number 10. And this continued, and what continued is what's in verse number 8 eight and 9 about him speaking, disputing, persuading, and teaching daily the Word of God. This continued by a space of two years so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And if you read verse 11 down to verse 20, you'll see that that had such an impact that it put, it put, it put witchcraft and occultism on the run. It, it caused the, uh, d- the dissemination of the word of God. Verse 20 it says, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. So all through... Asia, from Ephesus, we would say all through the Middle West, from Chicago, the Word of God prevailed. Everyone heard the Word. That's why we spend so much time here trying to get the message out there. You know, we teach here, we gather here, we study here. We don't come here to be entertained. We come here to be edified so that we can go out there and scatter the message. That's why we do the radio. That's why we do the television. That's why we do the literature. That's why we do all the media. It's to get the message out. That's what these people do. That's the natural thing you do when you've got truth. You want other people to hear it too. And it grew. And it prevailed. And there was a tremendous movement all across Asia. And it spread over into Europe in Acts 18 and so forth. And the Word of God went out. In fact, there's a great verse in Thessalonians, chapter 1, where it talks about the Thessalonians. He said, I, everywhere I go, they all talk about you guys. I don't need to go anywhere. You guys don't need me down there. You're doing the job. I won't go somewhere else where nobody's heard. Now, I want you to contrast that with 2 Timothy chapter 1. Paul is in, is, is, is in his last moments. Here's a an old guy fixing to die, talking to a young guy, going to have to live on. 2 Timothy is Paul's last epistle. Verse chapter 1, verse number 15. Now he's writing to Timothy. Timothy is at Ephesus, where we just read about in Acts 19, but things are different now. Acts 19, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia, look at that, be turned away from me. Acts 19, the word of God prevailed all through Asia. Now, all they that are in Asia are turned away from me. You see the difference? One place, it's prevailing. Now, it's fallen in the street. That contrast, if you look at chapter 2, verse 18, talking about Hymenaeus and, and, and Philetius, uh, he says, who concerning the truth have erred. They've got the truth, but they've erred. What did they do? Saying the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. They've quit rightly dividing the word, and they said the resurrection's past. We're not in the dispensation of grace anymore. We're off in a future dispensation. That's over with. We're back in Israel's program. They had the Bible, but they're not rightly dividing it. Chapter 3, verse 8. For as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these resist the truth. You try to show them the truth. You try to say, hey, here's what the Scripture says, not that. And what do they do? They resist. Now, how did they resist? That's Janus and Jambres. What'd they do? You remember Janus and Jambres? You didn't know that their name in Exodus. This is the law's subsequent narrative. They were the two guys. Moses come in, threw his, snake, his rod down. It became a snake. You remember that? Janus and Jambres. Pharaoh looks over and he says, what you guys going to do? <laughs> and they come up and they throw down their rod. Now they got two snakes. They outdid Moses two to one, it looked like. Now did they... Did it work out that way at the end? No. But you see how he says, as 
Janus and Jambres withstood Moses. What did they do? They duplicated what he did double over, look like. So these resist the truth, men of corrupt mind. Listen, your ministry, your life is going to look like the opposition outdoes it two to one. You understand that? I tell people all the time. They say, well, we don't have a small little group. I said, if you've got more than eight people, you've got more than Noah had, and he saved the world with eight people. <laughs> they had thousands down at, the, down, at the, down at the circus, but he saved the world with eight people because he had the truth. And it's the truth that saves the world, not how many people have it. Chapter 4, verse number 4, they should turn away their ears from the truth. And we turned to the fables. That's talking about. So these verse, this is what's ha, this is how they went from the word of God growing and prevailing and they to all they've turned away from me. But I want you to understand. If that's true, then you can't go back to church tradition. You can't go back to the church fathers, even the earliest church fathers. You can't go back to church scholarship for truth. Because where was the church scholarship, the church tradition, and the church fathers when Paul died? They left him. They departed. They're in error and apostasy. The only place you can go back to is the book. Now that was the fundamental underlying concept in the Reformation. The truth be told, our ancestors have always been there. You've got to understand that. In this book, there's a fascinating opening chapter where he quotes, where he talks about John Wycliffe. And he says this, about the, there's a thing called the, the, the 12 conclusions of the Lollards. Now, you don't know anything, you don't, I'm going to read this, it's going to bore you to stiff, but I'm going to make a point. The 12 conclusions of the Lollards. John Wycliffe's followers became known as Lollards. In 1390, when did Luther put his thesis on the wall, on the door at Wittenberg? 1517. In 1390, the 12 conclusions of the Lollards were tacked on the doors of the Westminster Hall in London. Now, is 1390 before 1517? Yeah. Those 12 conclusions of the Lollards, Luther's 95 thesis, didn't say anything about getting out of the Catholic Church, didn't say anything about the gospel of grace. In fact, they didn't even express justification by faith. Luther didn't understand it then. It was in some years after that that he actually came to understand justification by faith alone. We pray that God in His endless goodness reform our church all out of joint to the perfection of the first beginning. <laughs> that's where, the, that's the, where the, the, the track began. And it began talking about justification. By grace through faith. It began talking about the authority of the Scriptures. It began talking about things that you and I would talk about. My point to you is that this didn't start with the Reformation. What happened at the Reformation is that it got, it got some public airing. Things had gotten so bad in the big, big, in, in the big visible church that when Luther and compadres began to raise the issue... It got moment, but people like us were always there. So what do we do when all that big stuff goes away? We just do what we've always been doing. That makes sense to you? That's the point. You ought to appreciate the fact that you've got, you've got ancestors. You, you ought to know something about your spiritual history back then. Peter Waldo, 1140 to 1205. That's before the Reformation, 12th century. Peter Waldo is often called the forerunner of the Reformation. You know more about, him, about his followers than you do him. His followers are called Waldensians, Waldo followers. He translated or caused to be translated the Bible into the dialect of France where he, where he ministered. 
and was one of the first to provide the Bible in what came to be called the language of the people. From the second century, we have, we have copies of God's Word translated into the languages of people. I've said to you time and again, this stuff about the Bible issue, people argue about King James Bible, New Bible. Listen, there's something here you've got to understand in your Bible. When God wrote His Word, He provided it to be preserved. And part of the preservation process is to translate it into the languages of people and that the translation is as authoritative as the original language was. That's, I show you those very, in the Bible, that's the way the Bible treats translations. Now, you can treat them any way you want to, but that's the way God treats them. And with that translation, you get the proper text properly translated. It is His authority, and it's God's Word, and that's where the spiritual power is. These men understood that. And from the very first, saints have been trying to get God's Word into the languages of the nations because that's exactly what Paul said the commandment of the everlasting God is that His Word would be made known among all nations. you got to do that. you got to have languages. Well, they did that. And as Waldo does this, and he translates the Bible, right in the middle of the Dark Ages, that was the key to the growth of the Waldensian movement. Now, if you know anything about that period of time, Waldensians are the great enemies of the Vatican system. Waldo, for his trouble was carried off. His people were in the caves and the mountains of northwest Italy. It's where the churches met. They had an underground Bible college where they trained preachers to study God's Word, to preach God's Word, to take God's Word out into the communities in the world in which they lived knowing that they're going to be martyred. And they did it racing to preach as much as they could before they were martyred. They knew that was going to happen to them because it happened to everybody, all the rest of them. But they wanted to get it out as fast as they could and as far as they could before they got caught and killed. Peter Waldo, by the way, if you read Fox's Book of Martyrs and you read about the, the, Pied, the Valley of the Piedmont, 15, 1655, the Waldensians in the massacre of the Piedmont. You know, some years ago, our, country, our, our government was arguing about whether waterboarding is torture. It's torture, folks. If you don't believe it, come right up, put a towel on your head, pour some water in your face, and you'll say, ah, let me, it's torture. You know where, you know, one, of you, one of the places you first see it in history is in that valley of the Piedmont, where the papists were murdering, torturing, putting on the rack, your ancestors, people that believe what you believe, what I hope you believe, what we believe here, for preaching it and teaching it. And that, that, was, that was their reward. <laughs> and I think about that 1650, old Waldo's back here in, in 1100, his followers for 400 years are still preaching what he preached. That's the power of putting God's Word in the hands of people and the value of the life of a life given over to the Lord Jesus Christ. So it didn't just start in the Reformation. There, there are people just like us. You see little glimpses of them. But where are we going to show up in church history? Well, you aren't, probably. If you are, you'd be a little footnote where somebody was mad at you and said something nasty about you, and they wanted to record it so everybody knew that, they were, that, that, that you were a, a bad dude. But here you are. John Wycliffe is the first person that translated the Bible into, into English, Middle English. He had a Latin Bible, the old Latin translated into Middle English, which is like if you read Chaucer when you were in school or something, it's English you can't read, but it's, it's modern uh, modern English is the language of a King James Bible. Uh, that era, Shakespeare and, and so forth, that's called modern English. But Middle English is the, the predicate. Before that, there wasn't any English, by the way. Anybody ever ask you, where, where was your Bible in, where was the English Bible in 800? Well, it wasn't any English. So there wasn't an English Bible. Duh. You know, it just, you know, you, sometimes you scratch your head. 
But Wycliffe is called the morning star of the Reformation because he was the guy who, and they didn't have printing press, they had to hand print the Bibles. He translated into English. He was a scholar from Oxford and Cambridge. He translated it into English, and it began to be widely distributed. The law, the, the law his, his Bible, they were called Bible men, two guys would come get one Bible because it's hand printed. It takes six months to make the thing. By the way, I've seen, never been there. I'd love to go there sometime. But his, his home and his little church is preserved in, in, in England. And I've seen videos of it. The church building is about half the size of this auditorium. The little manse he lived in is about the size of those pews right there. This is not, you know, big, powerful looking stuff. And yet they spread, God, they spread God's word not just across England, and, and, and British, all across Europe. He was so beloved that after he died, 40 years after he died, the papists came, dug up his bones, burned them, and spread them on the river to get rid of him. <laughs> now, boy, you're really loved when they treat you like that. <laughs> the right guys love you. But they were called Bible men. Their preaching relied on the Scripture teaching God's Word. So that's, when I say that, I say that to you to, to say, by then it was too late to undo the knowledge of the truth. It was out. Now it wasn't out widely like Luther did it. Luther translated the Texas Receptus the anti-Catholic Bible. You understand there's the Counter-Reformation. We read you, I went over that stuff with you last week. The Counter-Reformation, the Catholic response, Council of Trent, was to condemn, anathematize anyone that used any Bible text other than theirs. All the Protestant Bible texts were the Bible text of a King James Bible. The Geneva Bible, the Great Bible, the Bishop's Bible, Tyndall's Bible. All a different Greek text. The Catholics said, anathema on this one. Got to use this one. You know where the modern versions come from? That Greek text. You know what the modern versions are? They're a part of the counter-reformation. If you don't know where the Reformation went, you just found an answer. This is bigger than just, I don't like that way, the way a thee or a thou is found in the Bible. If you don't know enough about your language to know the difference between a thee and a thou and a ye and a you, that's on you. Don't blame your Bible for that. But it's a bigger issue than that. And it explains where some of this stuff has gone. John Huss. I got a whole bunch of these guys I was going to tell you about. I'm looking at the clock. I can't do it. But anyway, John Huss. John Huss was uh, 1369 to 1415. Again, way before Luther. He was influenced by Wycliffe, and through the study of the Scripture, he discovered on his own that salvation isn't possible except through faith in Christ's payment for your sins at Calvary. And he, he began to study the Bible, and he gained the convictions, and he began to preach the, the, uh, against works-based salvation. He is denounced as a heretic. He's excommunicated by Rome, they call him to the council, uh, council in Constant, uh, Constance, Germany to stand trial, and he's found guilty, and he's burned alive at the stake in July the 6th, 1415. If you want to celebrate a date, celebrate that one, when his executioners chained him to the stake. And by the way, what they did with the Lollards when they would catch these, 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 these uh, lollards, they would take their Bible, put them at the stake, the two guys, burn them, but they would use their Bible to light the fire. They did the same with, with us. They chained him to the, to, 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 to the prior, and they asked him if he didn't want to repent, if he didn't want to recant. He said, my Lord Jesus Christ was bound with harder chains than this 
for my sake. Why should I be ashamed to be thus to this rusty one? And when the flames began to consume him, the Duke of Bavaria urged him to recant his faith in Christ, to retract what he's preaching. And he said, no, what I've taught with my lips I will see with my own blood. It was Huss, men like Huss, that the poet wrote, I saw the martyr at the stake. The flame could not his courage shake, nor death his soul appall. I asked from whence his strength was given. He looked triumphantly to heaven and said, Christ is all. Christ is all. Christ is all in all. That's your spiritual forefathers. Not a bunch of mossy back religionists running around in black robes with, a, with, a, with a, their collars turned backwards, arguing about some theological nitwittery. These are the guys that are your spiritual ancestors. William Tyndall in England, first man to translate the Bible, the whole Bible into English out of the original languages. He's a brilliant scholar and gifted linguist. In order to translate his Bible, he had to flee England because the papists go to Europe and hide. He's hiding in Europe. He's translated his Bible. Wonderful stories about how all those things work. But finally, he's betrayed by a friend into the hands of the papists, and they, they martyr him. His probably his most famous quote. When someone asked him and said to him, we'd be better... We, we had better be without God than the laws of the Pope. Tyndall's response was, I defy the Pope. He used to call him his hellishness. <laughs> and all his laws, and if God spare my life ere many years, I will cause the boy that drives the plow to know more of the Scriptures than thou dost. Now you can thank God for somebody like that. Because the majority of your Bible in English comes from his Bible in English. It took a hundred years to perfect the Word of God in English, but it started with Tyndall. And that process of the martyrs, they didn't translate out of an economic interest to make a publishing house money. They translated at the risk of their own blood to get the Word of God into your hands. You need to appreciate your heritage. I'm going to quit i got three more pages. These stories are exciting. You ought, you ought to get down and read them sometime. Read about Felix Manns. Guys like this that just uh, partnered with the Reformation. He was, a, he was a friend in Zurich of Zwingli. He learned by studying the Scriptures about salvation by grace. He learned from studying the Scriptures that a lot of the stuff the churches were doing weren't in the Scripture. He began to preach against those things. and says, the things that the church are doing that aren't in Scripture, we ought not do. And you know what? Zwingli, who was one of the better reformers, said, whoa, wait a minute. And they wound up taking this guy out into the middle of Lake Zurich, binding his hands and his knees and his feet together, and drowning him for his trouble. And Zwingli approved it. And the Council of Zurich approved, just like Calvin, got in agreement with him about something, and he had him martyred. The reformers didn't get that far away. They never came to understand some things about what the church, the local church is, and all that religious hierarchy, they held on to it. That's the reason I don't look to them as the great saviors. Now, he said, then what should we think about them? Well, I know the reformers didn't, they, they didn't go far enough and so forth. You can thank God for their courage. These men were willing to live hard lives, endure ridicule, exile, poverty, oftentimes martyrdom. Sometimes they're like, who was it that said, give me liberty or give me death? Patrick Henry. Then he died of old age in his bed. <laughs> Well, you know, good for him. But he's willing to stick his chin out. 
But some of these guys, I mean, they risk real things. And you can thank God for that. Because God did use them to reshape Europe politically and spiritually. And as I said, the fact that God graciously uses imperfect people, that means you've got a chance. Because we, we certainly are all that. But you can celebrate the accessibility of Scripture that came as a result. Waldo, Wycliffe, Luther, Tyndale, they all translated God's Word into the languages of people. And once you let the Word of God out into, among, the, among people where they can read it, that's no coincidence with that, that it had this widespread impact on people's lives. The Dark Ages were indeed spiritually dark. It was the inaccessibility of the Scripture by the common people that led to that darkness. And it was the propagation of the Scripture into the languages of the people that led to the spiritual light that we see and call the Reformation. And if I, I'm, I, like I said, I can disagree with some of these guys about doctrinal things, but just the fact that their emphasis they understood we'd need to make the book the issue. Scripture alone is where all the rest comes. Now, you know the Scripture is the real source of spiritual power. It's the Word of God that works effectually in you that believe. These guys, the key to their spiritual power is they walked in the light they had. And that's the key to, the, to, to spiritual light and life. A lot, of them, a lot of these reformers stopped where they started. I mean, that's the explanation for you go to a Lutheran church, an Anglican church, or a Presbyterian church, and you see all the sacraments, and you see the, 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 the state church stuff, and the liturgies, and the hierarchies, and you say, where did all that go? Well, they, they, they got some light and stopped. Others, like us, there before, thereafter, took advantage of the Scriptures, and continued the recovery. Because after they recovered the issue of justification by faith and brought it to the table on a widespread issue, it wasn't long before you go into the seventh, the, out of the 16th century into the 17th century into the 18th century, and you see a clear trail of recovery of truth. People began to see the difference between justification and uh, by grace through faith plus nothing and, and, and works. And they, they, they come and stand on that Pauline foundation. Then you begin to see people begin to see the difference between uh, the coming of Christ for the church, the body of Christ, and the coming of Christ to the earth. In fact, the old, they used to say it's his coming for the church and his coming with the saints. And, and as, as kindergartenish as that is as, in a statement, and yet... When people don't understand anything, that's a big... And once they saw that, they began to see the differences in the programs. And you begin to see people developing dispensational understandings. And you begin to see people, when they begin to understand dispensational understandings, see the difference between Israel and the body of Christ. And that leads them to see the difference between law and grace. And now, you know, you see prophecy and mystery, the revel has revealed. Law and grace, the system, Israel and the body, the operating, the, the agency. You begin to see those things come out in the 1700s and the 1800s and the early and through the 1900s, and voila, here we are, <laughs> sort of thing. And what they did is they began to make the scriptures the issue, and at every step, there was a a, a point that came where people had to say, "Okay, we see the ongoing of that, and we'll have to leave these things behind." When fundamentalism in the 50s and the 30s and the 40s and the 50s were confronted with the distinctive ministry of Paul in a clear, unambiguous way. And when they realized it was going to threaten their commission, threaten Pentecost, threaten their baptism, water rights, and so forth, when it's going to threaten their hierarchy, they backed up and said, whoa, wait a minute. Our tradition, our scholarship... The thing we've always done is more important. But there were, always, there were still people that said, no, but the Scripture's where we've got to go. We've been able to press those things. We've seen the understanding of the grace life issues, the intervention issues. All, every step we've made has been, hey, 
we're not going to do that. It's the, the book's got to be the issue. What saith the Scripture? And as we move along in that, look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Here, here to me is the, the quintessential attitude. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 13. 2 Corinthians 4, 13, we having the same spirit of faith, what? According as it is written, I, have, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. That's the spirit of faith that our ancestors have had. That's the spirit of faith we have. It is written. I believe it, and therefore I speak it. Do you ever hear anybody say, God said it, I believe it, that settles it? You need to take that middle out of there. God said it, that settles it. Whether you believe it or not, it settles it. Now, if you want to, do, if you want to be smart, <laughs> you'd say, that settles it, and I'll believe. I believe it said it. What says the Scripture? There it is. I believe it. And therefore, speak. My life comes out of that. That's why, there's a, that's why the Counter-Reformation in the 1500s and 1600s focused on getting rid of the Scriptures. Not getting rid of them. Getting them back under the control of Mother Church. Because they have to provide it for you. They're the authority. The church gave you the book, they say. The book says, the book gave you, gave you the church. And the whole argument is that it's the scholarship, the tradition, not the book. Well, you understand, that's where we go. So, having the book, but look with me at 1 Timothy 1. I made the point with you last time, I'll do it again this morning. Having the book is not enough. It's the basis. It's what you do with the book once you have it that provides the life. 1 Timothy 1, verse 3. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia. Now, here's Timothy going to be left by Paul at Ephesus. The great revival was there, but that revival had fallen away. Paul had warned the Ephesian elders in Acts 20 when he was there. After my departing, grievous wolves are going to come in and attack the assembly. That had happened. From without, they came in with false doctrine. From within, they sought to draw people away from themselves. There was division, false doctrine. That's why 1 Timothy gives, Timothy has given these specific instructions of how to set in order the local assembly because the local assembly is always the bed from which ministry is designed to function. Not hierarchy, not denominational things, not religious organizations, but the local assembly, the gathering together of believers in a local, in a local geographic area gathered together to do the work of the ministry. What's that? God would have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's the ministry of reconciliation. We gather together. Paul says, here, let me show you how to organize yourself so you can do that. That's what 1 Timothy is about. 2 Timothy is about the things unruined. Here's what to do in, in that situation. Notice how he tells him, verse, verse 3. I besought thee to abide still in Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou shouldest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Don't change the doctrine. Amen. Number one. What doctrine? The doctrine you got from Paul. Okay? So the first responsibility is don't change it. By the way, if you're going to preach the Word, you've got to have the Word. You've got to rightly divide the Word. Don't change it. Neither give heed to fables. That's stories, religious stories about, hey, have you heard about how many they got over there? Have you seen the... Don't listen to all this story stuff. Don't listen to Janice and Jambres. Hey, he had two snakes. Moses only had one. I mean, how do you think Mo felt about that after that happened? Hmm. Well, you know. 
neither endless genealogies. That's the who's who crowd. I can trace my, my church back in apostolic succession all the way to the apostles. Eh, wrong apostles. That ever dawn on you? I taught a Bible class years ago down in Alabama in the home of the treasurer of the Roman Catholic Church in the town I pastored in. And they'd asked me to come over and teach a Bible class. I said, well, I can do that. I put up a little chalkboard and started, you know, chalk started flying. And I started teaching them how to write and divide the word. About the third lesson, the guy looked at me and he says, you know, this thing about Paul, where's Peter fit in? I said, he fits in right over. He said, but that's not us. I said, ah. <laughs> Treasurer of the Catholic Church. Graduate with a master's degree from Catholic University in Cincinnati. He looked at me and said, then why are we following Peter? I said, you better go back down to your priest who was an authentic Italian. <laughs> Italian. Italian, whatever. He was from Italy. <laughs> Bonafides. And ask him. He did. And you know what happened the next week? The priest showed up to find out what was going on. I said, this is fun. <laughs> Do this some more. Then they closed the Air Force Base and they all left town. But uh, when you see that issue. I'm claiming apostolic succession back to who? Wrong guy. Then the whole claim is bogus. See how liberating that is? I don't need to worry about that. We were in Bulgaria some years ago with Nick Trzyski and the Bulgarian priest that was going to go with us into the prison. He was asking me, he said, what church do you pastor? And I said, sure, what Bible church? He says, well, what is that? I said, well, it's a, it's a Bible church. And he, he said, well, who, is your, who are your successors? And what he wanted a line of, well, you're not authentic like I am. I have, I'm in a succession that goes all the way back to the apostles. And I said to him, well, okay, wrong apostles. Must be the wrong church. But that's how religion thinks. That's where denominationalism comes from. Paul says, Timothy, that little church in Ephesus has had a ministry all over Asia. Falling on hard times. So you go down then you tell them, don't you change what I taught you. You quit listening to all that story stuff. All those religious stories. You say, where's the verse that that is in? God told us to build this. Where is that verse? Why, do you understand our scholar? Don't pay attention to the genealogies. But you do what? They minister questions. By the way, have you ever wondered why there's so many questions in Christendom? Why they bite and devour one another like Galatians 5 says? Why they're divided like 1 Corinthians 3 says? Well, you just read an answer. Rather than godly edifying, which is in faith. So what, what, the min what has to be there is the godly edifying that comes through the message of grace. So is the Reformation over? Probably. Is its influence waned? Yes. But we were there. We weren't depending on the Reformation. We enjoyed the, the fruits of it. Don't get me wrong. I appreciated the things that it brought. But I'm not locked into that. And we're going to be living, you people, you, you guys that are younger, I, gosh, it's hard to say you're an old man now. But I'm an old guy now. I only have another month to be in my 60s. You know what that means, don't you? Yeah, you, you heard me. Okay. All the old folks heard me. <laughs> but you, you, you folks that are under 40, under 50, and under, and there's a host of you, more, more than half of you are, are, are in that category, way more than half of you. You're going to live in a world that's so different, but it's going to be like your ancestors. You have ancestors that lived in a world like that and carried on a ministry that's reached to us. When we bought this building back in the O's, we were at the little building on Neva. 
we had a lot of money in the bank. We'd sold the old building. And we had a house full of people. And I told her, all of our guys were there. Everybody's happy. Things were working right along. On the raid, doing all that. And I told the guy, I said, you know, we can stay here and in 20 years be dead. Because most of you guys are going to be dead in 20 years. The people I was talking to then. Most of them are dead now with the Lord. Or we can move out of this little landlocked location, find a place that will be, uh, we needed the room. We swapped a 4,000 square foot building for the 16,000 square foot building. And it's not big enough now. But we do that. We can die. Or we can shoulder the responsibility. And everybody said almost, oh man, let's, let's keep it alive. Provide a, provide a ministry for the future. But the ministry isn't just a building. That's a site to carry on ministry. The ministry is that godly edifying. Now, what's that talking about? Uh, time's up. I don't have time to talk about it. It's 1 o'clock. <laughs> oh, no, it's only 12 o'clock. Oh, <laughs> we didn't get the clock fixed. Godly edifying, which is in faith, is the application of that edification process that Romans chapter 16, verse 25 and 26 tells you to follow. It's the application of the doctrinal structure that Paul's epistles are. Listen, you can be, you could have flunked kindergarten and get this. Because God put it in his word, Romans to Philemon, in a doctrinal succession. Doctrine, reproof, correction. Doctrine, reproof, correction. Those books are laid out exactly the way that edification process takes place. If you spend just three, time reading three chapters a day, I'm almost tempted to ask you how many are doing that. Mm -hmm. eh, I get a few volunteers. If you're not, shame on you. I mean it. Three chapters. You'd read Paul's epistles through in one month, 29 days. And if you did that for six months, you won't know yourself. Because that book changes you that much. And the structure changes you and causes you to grow. And that's what the ministry is about. Paul told the Corinthians, I couldn't know a thing among you but save Christ and him crucified because they didn't have that down yet. That's Romans. He says, but we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. There's some more for you to learn. You go from milk to meat. There's some edification. There's some growing for you to do. And you know what happens when you grow? When things grow, you begin to move. You watch these little babies around here. They're all wrapped in mama. And, you know, and then they start growing. And pretty soon they're crawling around on the floor. But you know what happens when a baby starts growing? It isn't long he poops his pants. <laughs> and he burps up on you. Now they get, Hopefully they outgrow that. <laughs> but there, you have all, all those stages of growing. And what happens? You don't go, eh, get rid of him. <laughs> Throw him out and have another one. No. You tend to him. There's reproof, correct? There's growing. Spiritually speaking, we do that. That's the context. That's what a local church is about. It's being a context in which to grow. The goal is to take that life. Verse 5. The end of the, you do what I'm telling you. The end of the commandment is charity. People are always talking about having charity. Let's love everybody. Listen, charity isn't loving everybody. Charity is something far more than that. You can go down to the gay pride parade, they love everybody, except you. <laughs> Charity is being able to have to a value, think about something, look at it, value it, esteem it, cherish it the way God does. There's the labor of love, the patient, the, 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 the work of faith, the labor of love, the patience of hope. And the way you get that is doing is that godly edifying which is in faith. In our conference last summer, we, we asked the question, did the Reformation fizzle? 
It, it has. But my point to you this morning is, listen, folks, the people who really have been our, our people like us all through the ages, we're still here. They were before and will be after. We just need to be busy about being who we are as Bible-believing grace believers, taking it seriously. Listen, movements and men rise and fall. Legacies fade. Histories are forgotten. But God's Word endures forever. And we're people of the book. Let it be so. Amen. Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for these great saints in the past who've labored, risked courageously the ridicule, the reproach, the danger, even the giving of their lives that we could have it and not just possess it in our hands, we could understand it. And we could take it and pass it on to the next generation until you come for us. May we live with the urgency of your soon coming. May we live with a consciousness that our lives count right now and that we may not be at this moment facing martyrdom, but we also face the, the truth that we may not have tomorrow. So may we live with an urgency that holds lightly on this life and clings resting confidently as an anchor steadfast and sure in that blessed hope that we have in Christ. And may we be laboring until you come for us. We thank you for the privilege of it.